speeder firmer, hard than more fierce, stronger than. Mind must be the firmer, hard the more. Saxon warrior, you see. On the weekends mainly, although due to shrinking membership, it's now usually every second Sunday. I take part in historical reenactments. Our group is called the Sons of Woden Incorporated. We get asked to do battles at lots of places, farming events, movie premieres, um, dog shows, that sort of thing. I also collect lots of weapons. Saxon swords, of course. Viking, Norman, medieval. I also have 16 Viking battle axes, 15 Boer War rifles, and three blunderbusters, English, 17th century. So, you know, if you need to get rid of anyone you don't like, I'm your man. The network of reenactors 
ranges far and wide. You've got the Romans, the Vikings, the Armored Noir Knights, to name just a few. On any given weekend, we could be in a town near you, engaged in the noble art of civilized massacre. But this weekend, it's the big one. The highlight of the reenactment here. The town, Narawahia. The occasion, the annual A and P show. The battle, the Battle of Morden. The greatest ever fought between the Saxons and the Vikings. It was an epic showdown between two proud peoples. A stirring story of bravery and betrayal. Have you read the ancient poem that was written about it? That has survived throughout the ages? Oh, you should, you know. You really should. Broken Verda. It was shattered. At dawn, the Earl Bjarnok began to marshal the men of Morden. He rode about and advised. He told his men how they should stand firm, not yielding an inch. He bade them grasp their shields in their hands tightly and upright and not be afraid. After he had urged on his army to the utmost, he dismounted with his escort at a carefully chosen place where he knew his most faithful men were waiting. The situation was hopeless. The Saxons on the mainland near the town of Morden facing opposite them on a little island, a huge Viking host bang for blood. <sighs> but the surging waters of the river Panta separate the two sides. No one can get at the other. Stalemate. Oh, this is going to be a tremendous battle for the sons of Woden. <clears throat> Even more magnificent than our famous victory over the Romans. Augustine's second legion at the Tiawamoto anniversary fair in 98. Boy, that was rough. They are mad bastards. Oh, hey, I peeked down to your mouse. Hey, look, I managed to throw Dr. Smith off the scent. Oh, that's all right, Donna. I think I'll stay here a bit till the coast is clear. We're going to have to talk to him sooner or later, you know. I mean, he probably just wants to. No! All right, we shouldn't be doing this beard. Well, Jackie says your two nurses down. Yeah, we are, but we can cope. Jackie's just a lazy bitch. I can do this. No, it's all right. I've started now, so I can finish it. All right, well, you make sure you have a break after, yeah? You look tired, Pete. Have you even had a holiday yet this year? No, but I am going to Taupo next month. Oh, neat. Yeah, but I hear you're going to Samoa. Oh, yeah, but it'll only be if Gary says we can afford it. Oh, OK. So when's the wedding? Oh, stop it! <laughs> yeah, but Simon will be great. I mean, I really like holidays. We can, like, just lie on the beach and do nothing, you know? Yeah, I love the beach. Tap will be good, though. Big tournament. All the reenactment groups will be there. It'll be three days of battles and rustic crafts. And this one's going to be a cracker too, Donna. Because the Wellington Romans are bringing Big Bertha, their huge catapult, amazing machine, weighs over half a ton. Mm -hmm. Did you know, Donna, that back in the day, when they were laying siege to a city, the Romans would use their catapults to fire live cattle, which would really freak out their enemies. Can't do that anymore, of course. But there's a very strong rumour going around that the Wellingtonians had been in touch with the local freezing works and will instead be firing whole frozen cow carcasses. Oh, um, that's really cool, Pete. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm really quite busy, so I better go now, but I, I might pop in on you later, yeah? Oh, hey. Janet's been asking after you. Oh. Really? She likes you. Bye. Happy girl. I can't wait till this weekend's carnage. It's been a long week. Must have taken about 18 bodies down to the mortuary.
century this week, including seven in one day. Wednesday, I think. It's mostly heart and cancer problems that get them round here in the end, you know. You don't see many in here, done in by a Saxon longsword or scalped by a Viking battle axe. No, this is where they finally snuff it. Not on the battlefield or in the royal bedroom, surrounded by their serving wenches and retainers, but on Ward 6 next to a Mrs. Maxwell and some guy who can't blow his nose properly by himself. We've had all sorts in here over the years. But my favorite patient is Janet. She's a reenactor as well, although she's with the Argent Lords. They concentrate more on dancing and arts and crafts from the Middle Ages. But we still have some great talks about all the old battles. We've come across each other lots of times over the years on the field of battle. She's lovely. George and Peter, we could you please bring you and your battle ass up to the prow of the longboat or office? Over. That's the boss, John. Just ignore him. He can be a bloody asshole sometimes. Always telling me what to do. Olaf Tryggvason, leader of the Vikings, stood upon the riverbank and bellowed a message from the seafarers to Birknoff, the Earl, on the opposite bank. We, brave seafarers and servants of Thor, say to you that we will be so good as to let you give gold rings in return for peace. It is better for you to buy up our aid with tribute than that we, so cruel, should cut you down in battle. We need not destroy one another. If you agree to this, we'll settle for peace in exchange for gold. If you, most mighty over there, wisely decide to disband your men, giving money for peace to the seafarers on their own terms, and make a truce, we'll take to the sea the tribute you pay and keep our promise of peace. Bribery! That doesn't work for Birknoff, the Saxon leader. He was a great man, a wrangly old dog, 60 summers old. But his voice was rich and strong, like a great oak. Can you hear, you pirate, what these people say? They will pay you a tribute of whistling spears, of deadly darts and proven swords. Weapons to pay you, pierce, slit, and slay you in the storm of battle. Listen, Olaf, you see. Break the bitter news to your people, that a noble Earl and his troops stand over here, guardians of the people and of the country, the home of Ethelred, my prince, who will defend this land to the last ditch. We'll sever the heathen's heads from their shoulders. We would be shamed greatly if you took our tribute and embarked without battle since you barge so far and brazen me into this country. No, you will not get your treasure so easily. The spear's point and sword's edge. Savage battle play must teach us first that we have to yield tribute. Isn't he great? Well, I'm playing him. Me. I'm big enough. Voice makes it a bit harder, of course but I'd never give it away. Going out to battle with the boys is still the best thing ever. We keep history alive and usually all die in the process. It all started for me when I was in England. I was always interested in history and felt a longing to go there, to walk along the same streets that people had walked for thousands of years. It took me ages to save up, lots of extra shifts and overtime, but I finally did it. I did a tour of all the battle sites, Hastings, Tewkesbury, Stamford Bridge, stayed in little pubs and things, and of course Malden. I arrived at Malden first thing in the morning and went directly to the battle site. Two shores 
and the narrow causeway under a leaden sky on a winter's day. Frostbound and freezing, bleak but beautiful. My face ceased up. Straight away it felt a bit different from the other places, more familiar or something. Anyway, later that evening in the pub, an old guy started reciting the poem. He just got up and started cracking on into it. You could have heard a pin drop. Something turned on in my head, and I saw myself there a thousand years ago. I could smell the sea. I felt the sword at my side. I could see the Viking hordes rushing towards me. It was amazing. I had to leave the next day. But I knew I wanted to keep that feeling with me always. But how? Eureka! Join a Saxon reenactment group. There really wasn't anything like that in New Zealand at the time. But eventually, I ferreted them out. The Sons of Woden. After a few years, I started playing all the great parts in all the battles. Alfred the Great, Ethelred the Unready, and Birkner. I want to go to Scandinavia next, which means I'm working lots of extra shifts at the moment. But it has to be done. You know what they say, no thine enemy. Then Birkner gave word that all his warriors should walk with their shields to the riverbank. The troop on either side could not get to the other, for there the flood flowed after the turn of the tide. The water streams ran together. They thought it too long before they were able to clash their spears. The East Saxons and the ship army beset the river Panta in proud array. And yet no warrior could injure another except by the flight of a feathered arrow. The tide ebbed. The pirates stood ready. Many bold Vikings eager for battle. Then Birnoff, guardian of his men, ordered a warrior to defend the ford. It was Wostan, Chiola's son, the bravest of brave kin. <laughs> With his spear, he pierced the first seafarer who stepped forth unflinching onto the ford. When they saw that and found the defenders of the ford too fierce, for their liking, the hateful strangers began to use guile and asked if they could cross, leading their warriors over the water. Are you keeping up with what's going on? Well, that's okay. I'll go over it again just to make sure you're absolutely clear. You see, the tide's gone down a bit. Hey, mate. Busy in here? Oh, hi, Troy. Yeah, we're bloody busy in radiology, mate, but I'm, I'm on a bit of a break now, so I've got to move my bones. Don't mind me. Are you making a bed? Yeah, I actually think you should pull it out a bit, because... Yeah, mate, all the nurses say I'm the best at it. They call me the bed maestro, me, mate. <laughs> hey, guess what, Pete? I got me a new stereo on the weekend. It's bloody loud, mate. I reckon if you turned down our street, it'd be the first thing you'd hear. <laughs> hey, I was playing it the other day, right? And Mum just started yelling at me to turn it down. But I just told her to shut up, because that's what I am, mate. I'm a rebel. <laughs> hey, sorry, Pete. I think you should pull these sheets up a bit. Yeah, that'll say I'm the best of the beds, mate, because... Hey. Hey, what's this? Looks like a bloody great... Don't touch that! And don't tell anyone I've got it here! Do you understand? Yeah, no, 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 I won't tell security. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 Vikings are in the mainland 
where the Saxons are, but it's too narrow and unstable to allow any more than one or two warriors across at any one time, which makes them easy pickings. As the Vikings have found out to their peril, round one to the Saxons. So now the Vikings, cunning bastards that they are, had decided to try and ask the Saxons nicely if they would allow them safe passage across to their side of the shore and make room for them to camp there so that there will be a chance for battle to be joined. Then, in foolhardy pride, the Earl allowed those hateful people access to the fort. Bethnoth began to call out across the cold water. The warriors listened. Now the way is clear for you. Come over to us quickly, warriors to the slaughter. God alone can say who will control the field of battle. It's interesting. I was talking about this bit to Janet just the other day. And it's her opinion that Bethnoth's decision was just another example of stupid macho pride on his behalf. I disagree. You see, the point is that this was the first example of the great English tradition of fair play. There's a chance, at least, for glory now. The slaughter wolves, the horde of Vikings, wade into the west across the river Panther. The sea bearers hoisted their shields on high and carried them over the gleaming water. Birknoth and his warriors awaited them, ready for battle. He ordered his men to form a shield wall and to stand firm against the enemy. Lunch time. All sorts of things can happen in this hospital. Sometimes you'll catch the glimpse of a young doctor weeping on somebody's shoulder, which usually means she's stuffed up and killed somebody. Or all the power will go off for no reason. Then there's a celebrity spotting. Hours of fun. Muldoon died here. Troy released the body. They were all here, longing, rolling, according to Troy. And last week, Maury saw Joe Collins walk in. Actually, a very odd thing happened yesterday. It was very cloudy and dark, but somehow the way the sun shone through made all the clouds look yellow. The whole sky glowed yellow. I wandered around doing all the usual jobs, but every time I looked out a window, all I could see was this yellow sky, and it made everything in the hospital look yellow. It was rather unsettling. But inside here, I was safe. I didn't need to go out there. I was safe in here. In the old days, often before a great battle, the sky would turn red. It was a sign, a portent. Okay. So I saw a yellow sky, but you get my drift.
when his chance of glory was about to begin. The time had come for all the doomed men to fall in the fight. The clamor began, the ravens wheeled, and the eagles circled overhead, craving for carrion. They were shouting on earth. They sent their spears, hard as files, and darts, ground sharp, flying from their hands. Bowstrings were busy, shield carrying point. Bitter was the battle. Brave men fell on both sides. Youths choking in the dust. Self-same son Wolfman was wounded. Slashed by the sword, he chose to sleep on the bed of death. His slaughter was avenged. The Vikings were repaid in kind. I was told that Edward swung his sword so savagely, a full-blooded blow, that a fated warrior fell lifeless at his feet. Birgnos shouted out his thanks to him, his chamberlain, as soon as he had a chance to do so. Thus the brave men stood firm in battle, each sought eagerly to be first in with his spear, winning the life and weapons of a doomed warrior. The dead sank to the earth, but the rest stood unshaken, and Birgnos spurred them on. Bad each of the warriors give thought to brave deeds who wished to gain glory against the Danes. They had and hewed and slew many seafarers. Victory was in sight. The Vikings were disheartened and desperate. Jesus out of their enemies. It's usually Brian Carmichael and his mates from the Auckland North who do that. Accountants mostly. But those Vikings had nothing to fear because they believed that when they died, their souls were escorted to Valhalla by a host of boxing blonde Valkyries. flowers in her room. Oh, okay. Looks like flowers might be the go then, Donna. Thanks. <laughs> Don't mention it. Good luck. Bye. Dr. Smith. Donna, how are you? Busy. Well, yes, yeah, busy as what we all are. I mean, this is a hospital after all. Yeah. So, you still haven't seen Peter? Well, that just depends. Are you going to apologize to him? Well, why on earth would I want to do that? You ruined his voice! I mean, he should be suing you or something! God! Is that what he told you? Listen, Don. We need to talk. Okay. The berserkers created chaos and confusion. The Saxons were scattered. Birknoth was unhorsed. This caused certain cowards to beat a hasty retreat. Ah! Ah! Godric, help me! Help me, Godric! Ah! Oh. 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 
Godric fled from the battle, forsaking Beardloth. Forgetting how often his lord had given him the gift of a horse, he leapt into the saddle of his lord's own horse, most unlawfully, and both his brothers, Godwina and Godwig, galloped beside him. Forgetting their duty, they turned from the fight and headed to the forest. They headed to their fastness and saved their lives. And more men followed. And was it all right? Had they remembered the formal rewards that the prince had given them? Generous gifts! Actually, same thing happened to us last weekend. We were fighting the Egyptians, new group, call themselves the bloody sun children or something. We had to sort of make up an Egyptian invasion of England. But anyway, we were doing quite well in the battle when all of a sudden, Bob and Paddy said they had to go now because they had to take their kids to netball. And they'd been going on and on in the pub the weekend before about how they were going to enjoy slaughtering those Egyptian pansies. Well, it screwed us up completely and we got routed. Bloody Bob and Paddy. Those Egyptians wore skirts for goodness sakes. There won't be a repeat of anything like that this weekend. We will march into the West Bank Trust, Nalawahia Stadium, and claim it for Woden. It was just as Oliver once said to Bernard, remember? At an open council in the meeting place, that many who spoke proudly of their prowess would prove unworthy of their words under battle stress. Year 10323, Laurier Security Base. I'm approaching the situation point. About to rendezvous with my contact. I hope I... Yeah, mate, he's, he's been in there for over three hours. Oh, and that sword's bloody dangerous, mate, because. Yeah, okay, Troy. I'll take it from here. You just go back to work now. Okay. No, okay. Mm. Afternoon, Peter. Been here a while, I hear. Well, I gotta get the job done properly. Well, a little bird tells me that uh, you might be in possession of a dangerous weapon. A sword, in fact. Medieval in design, tempered steel. Approximately 16 inches in length. Really? Oh, um, there must be some kind of mistake, Laurie. No, there's no mistake, because I have this from a very reliable source. Mind if I take a look around? No, of course not. You just go right ahead. you like that chick up on Ward 6? What's her name? Janet? Yeah. She's pretty foxy for a chick her age. Forget about it if I was you. You've got no bloody chance. This bed's a bloody mess. Hey, look at this. What's this, eh? Looks like something to do with a bloody sword, by my reckoning. What, that? Oh, no. That, that's actually a very rare Aborigine artifact. Yes, what that is, is it's, it's a straight boomerang. <laughs> Highly impractical, of course. Well, whatever it bloody is, it shouldn't bloody be here, because that's against hospital rules and occupational health and safety guidelines. Take it back to the orderly's office when you're finished here. Okay, Laurie. No problem. 10 3, 10 3 Laurie to security base. Have neutralised the situation. No need for backup. Over. I'm not going to take any action this time. But I've got my eye on you. 
How long have you been working for here anyway, eh, Peter? 20 years? Still taking orders from John? I pretty much run security now, mate. Once Bruce retires, I'll be in. That's achievement. That's a career path. And I did 20 years in the Navy. Went all over the bloody place. That's a life. I know what you get up to on the weekend with your play fights, you sick bastard. You're nothing but a sad, pathetic little man. stopped him all too soon. He destroyed the Obergnoth's arm. The golden hilted sword dropped from his hand. He could hold it no longer, nor wield a weapon of any kind. Then still, the old warrior spoke these words, called on his brave companions to do battle again. He no longer stood firmly on his feet, but swayed and raised his eyes to heaven. O oh guardian of the people, let me praise and thank you for all the joys I have known in this world. Now, gracious Lord, as never before, I need your grace, that my soul may set out onto its journey to you, O oh Prince of Angels, that my soul may depart into your power and peace. I pray the devils may never destroy it. Mind must be the farmer, heart the more fierce, courage the greater as our strength diminishes. Well, that 
that's where the poem ends. It rather breaks off suddenly, I'm afraid. They've lost the rest in a great big fire in the 18th century. But of course, the battle was lost, nobly and bravely, but lost in the end. There's a story that after the battle, the monks came back in order to give Vietnam a decent burial. But the Vikings had cut off his head as a trophy of their victory. Hi, Peter. Dr. Smith, how did you find me? Donna. Yes, I was actually thinking of you the other day. I was watching Braveheart on DVD. Pretty good, pretty good. Have you seen it? Yes, it's a club classic. So how are the Dungeons and Dragons going? Reenactments. Oh yes, that's right. The Vikings. No, Saxons. We kill Vikings. Right, oh yes, right, good. Um, so how are you, Peter? Um, busy? Well, this is a hospital after all. Why have you missed your last two appointments? I've been working lots of extra shifts. Well, you shouldn't be working at all. I want to go to Scandinavia. Well, the only way that's going to happen is if you take the treatments. Says who? Well, me, the doctor. Okay. I'll see when I can squeeze you in. Oh, great. How about Monday at 12? Fine. Good. I have to say, Peter, the voice sounds great since we got the tumour out. Okay, it's uh, breathy and husky, but you know what? It could be worse. Oh, really? How much worse could it possibly be? Well, you could be mute. Right, well, I've got a lot of patients to see, so I'd better skedaddle. But I'll see you on Monday. What do you think of these flowers? Pete, Janet's just passed away. She, she had a mess of coronary. I'm so sorry. Um, do, do you want to come in and see her?
things that the Saxons believed in. Long before the missionaries came along and long after they left, they called it weird, which meant what will be will be. Dread day. The Saxons lost over 800 men. But their song, their dark song, was sung for a thousand years. So this world dwindles day by day and passes away. For a man will not be wise before he has weathered his share of winters in the world. Nothing is ever easy in the kingdom of earth. The world beneath the heavens is in the hands of fate. Here possessions are fleeting. Here friends are fleeting. Here man is fleeting. Here kinsman is fleeting. The whole world becomes a wilderness. So spoke the wise man in his heart, as he sat apart in thought. Brave is the man who holds to his beliefs, nor shall he ever show the sorrow in his heart, before he knows how he can hope to heal it. <laughs>